Um, so um, to start off, I'll just give you a bit of background about Benchpeg so that you know where we're coming from. Um, as Rosie alluded to, we were founded in um, 2006. Um, we uh, basically are a virtual organisation working within the jewellery space. Um, and really, we, f we were founded in um, personal response to something called the Jewellery Sector Investment Plan, which was a publicly funded initiative um, founded in and around Hatton Garden, um, aimed at strengthening um, the jewellery industry to make it more competitive in the global marketplace. And what the JSIP found through extensive analysis was that the UK industry was fragmented, and an aspect of this was due to the lack of intercommunication um, within the supply chain. And really, Benchpeg was a personal reaction to this. Um, we instigated the first digital newsletter in the UK jewellery industry, and we had 50 people on a, on a list who wanted to receive useful information. And uh, six years later, we find ourselves with over 8,000 subscribers, never having um, marketed or advertised ourselves. So our growth has been completely organic. Um, our ethos is um, communication through collaboration. Um, we believe that information should be freely accessible to those who need it. And to this end, we work collaboratively with a number of industry organisations as a conduit and essentially as an in an intermediary role to create connections and aid the dissemination of information. To give you an idea about um, our impact, um, in the six years, we're going to be seven in February, um, that we've been doing this. And for the first six years, I only went full-time on Benchpeg last October. Um, we have placed over uh, 350 people in employment um, over that time. And um, we aren't publicly funded, um, but we do have a consultancy arm. And um, part of the work that we do with other organisations um, shows sort of um, how we work um, for the betterment of our industry. And that has been reflected in our recent invitation. Uh, 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 we were recently invited to um, be part of the National Skills Academy Advisory Board to help support industry apprenticeships. And um, we're looking to progress um, to formalise industry internships. But the reason we've been asked to assemble here today is to speak to you about the types of businesses that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis um, within the jewellery industry. Um, SMEs, um, which are anything from designers, designer makers, and medium-sized jewellery businesses, to macro manufacturing setups. Um, and we've brought some of the Benchpeg affiliates here today um, just to discuss. We're going to pretend you're not here and discuss between ourselves um, some examples of our own experiences um, of high-end uh, jewellery industry manufacturing technologies. So our panellists are Karen Painter. Hopefully it's clear who she is. <laughs> um, uh, she is a traditionally trained silversmith with over 15 years' experience in industry. She has an MA from the Royal College of Art and has a background in commercial jewellery design, research and the use of technology in our industry. Formerly, she spent 10 years at the Goldsmiths Company in the Technology and Training Department and is now a Creative Director at Benchpeg. Peter Oakley, sitting next to her, is a former ceramicist, educationalist, jewellery industry professional and now is research lead in the School of Materials at the Royal College of Art. For the past, for the past four years, Peter has, as part of his PhD, researched the jewellery industry, its supply chains and eth ethical issues surrounding these. Um, for this reason, Peter writes for Benchpeg, and he is Benchpeg's Ethics and Sustainability Associate. And finally, Jamie um, write, also writes for Benchpeg, um, but he is a very well-known blogger in his own right, otherwise known as Primitive Method. Um, Jamie, after completing his jewellery apprenticeship, undertook a residency at Loughborough University, where he focused on bullion manufacturing in the Middle Ages, and building on this work, um, he's um, basically earned himself a reputation be for being a specialist in medieval jewellery manufacturing techniques. Um, and he does this all, along, all alongside his day job, which is a bench jeweller in his family's business. 
So our discussion today um, is going to um, focus on how the jeweller or silversmith has um, and continues to develop um, new manufacturing technologies and how this influences or the, these influences could be advanced and nurtured for future collaboration and partnerships. And for the purpose of this panel discussion, we will be focusing on manufacture for precious metals in high-end jewellery, in the high-end jewellery arena. So to kick off, <laughs> Jamie, um, as well as being a traditionally trained jeweller, um, your experti expertise is in historical development of jewellery processes. So do you have a sense um, of how technological advances will affect the jewellery industry and its manufacturing capabilities in the future? Well, I think mean, the first thing I want to do is start with a bit of a history lesson. Um, I've been a little surprised that no one's really talked about uh, the history of any of the, the trades and technologies uh, that we've been discussing today. Um, so, uh, my feeling being that to, to sort of understand where we're going, we need to look at where we've come from. Uh, it's absolutely impossible for us to predict the future. Um, but hopefully, if we sort of, if we look at some historical technologies, um, you know, or, or sort of gen generally, if we look at his history, we can sort of make predictions about what, uh, what, what is to come. Um, is my slide? I only have one slide. There we are. Um, you won't be able to see much detail, but uh, that, that's not, the detail's not the important thing. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, metalwork was really the pinnacle of technological innovation. The mixture of chemistry, metallurgy, and, um, and art put the metal worker at the forefront uh, of, a, of advancement. Um, and because of the high cost of precious metals, uh, it meant that there was a, a great deal of kind of investment of skill and time and energy into actually, uh, actually pushing uh, jewellery forwards. Uh, the further back we go through history, the closer the links between the different metals and processes. And I think it's important to state here that uh, jewellery is by its nature a sort of very collaborative Thing. Uh, there's so many different um, types, of, types of knowledge and skill go into it. Uh, possibly that's true for all, all trades, but um, from my jewellery-centric view, that's how it, how it seems to me. Um, so, uh, for example, there's a, a writer called Theophilus who wrote in the 12th century um, a book called uh, On Diverse Arts, uh, which is a, a fabulous text. It covers glassmaking and painting, and most importantly for me, metalwork. Um, and it really is, it's quite a modern book um, in the sense if you read it, it really, you can kind of really hear him speaking from the past with a, with a very kind of modern, um, modern voice. Um, and he devotes the first part of his book to, to, uh, to tool making. Uh, so before he gets on to actually working with copper and gold and silver and bronze and things like that, uh, he talks about ferrous tool making, um, which I think kind of indicates just how, how important it was for the jeweller to be able to do these, these different things. Um, the, a later writer from the uh, Renaissance, uh, Birnuccio, uh, wrote a book called The Pyrotechnia, um, and that's uh, a sort of foundry handbook, and it's absolutely, uh, absolutely crazy what it actually includes. It has, uh, has sort of stuff about processing metals, but also uh, the initial smelting of them, uh, the way to produce different acids like nitric acid, uh, and even things like gunpowder and fireworks. Uh, it's called Pyrotechnia, literally the technology of fire. Um, and what I wanted to, to do, just this, this flowchart here, um, which is, uh, is far, far too complicated for you guys to actually be able to read, even if it was in focus, which it isn't. Um, but I wanted to get across to you that each one of these little boxes uh, is actually an individual process. And that process has a load of little pictograms, each one representing a tool that's required. Uh, and every process has associated skills. And they're all very different, but they're linked together. Um, and I think what... Um, What's kind of important there is, is just to realise how interconnected these things were. Uh, you probably wouldn't need one, um, you would probably wouldn't find one jeweller who was able to work with all of these techniques, but to actually run a workshop in the Middle Ages, you certainly have needed half of them, um, which is still a hell of a lot. It's about two dozen completely different um, sort of specialisms. Um, and there were specialised machinery, uh, machines that, sorry about this, I've not got a very good uh, pickup, but there were specialised machines, and Theophilus talks about. Um, sort of rotary devices for grinding amalgams, um, another one for decorating armour um, by inlay. Um, and, and another particularly interesting example from um, the pyrotechnia and similar texts is, uh, is bell founding, which is making bells by casting. And the, uh, the technology used for bell founding became important in the Middle Ages, uh, in the late Middle Ages, when gunpowder was created uh, or sort of brought, brought to Europe. 
and, uh, and suddenly the cannon founding technologies were, um, were useful for making cannon, uh, which is something that I, I dare say no one would have predicted uh, until gunpowder came along. Um, and interestingly, eventually the, um, the, uh, the sort of cannon was made differently, um, and so bell founding still exists, but no one makes cannon that way anymore. Um, so it's kind of unpredictable. Uh, you know, big social changes and technological changes can have unexpected impacts. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we all aim to, uh, to work for the MOD making artillery, um, you know, anything but. Um, but I think it is, you know, it's important to realize that you, you really can't predict where, um, where the kind of requirements for innovation are going to come from. Uh, the sort of different push and pull um, of, of skills and technology. Um, but of course, we don't live in the past, and I don't want to dwell too much on history. Um, the world has changed. Um, the jewelry trade has changed with it. Um, so there are still some artisans who work out there with very minimal technology. Um, I know one person who's semi-retired now, but can go anywhere with a briefcase. Uh, doesn't need electricity, just needs daylight. Um, but there really aren't many of those left now. Um, and I think um, there is a certain aspect of de-skilling going on in the trade. Um, it's a little bit like a second industrial revolution, so there are some social changes like reduced employment. Uh, there are also some very useful and interesting synergies between technologies. Um, I mean, to, to use a sort of industrial revolution uh, comparison, things like the lathe and other machine tooling were really important because, of course, once you've got a lathe, you can make a lathe. Um, and I think we're, we're entering that kind of era again with 3D printing technologies. Um, and in particular, you've got the RepRap project, and I think there's a couple of others where their eventual aim is to make 3D printers that print 3D printers. Um, if they do achieve that, um, we enter a whole world of craziness. You know, it's just like it's impossible to predict. It's a sort of technological singularity point. Um, but I think although I was talking about medieval technologies where, uh, where a jeweler like Theophilus would have created various machines, uh, we aren't really in that, um, in that era uh, anymore. Um, so a lot of the CAD CAM technologies, which are heavily utilised in the jewellery industry, aren't from the jewellery industry. Um, you know, these things have generally come from sort of engineering and, and things like that, where there's been a real focus on com uh, sort of uh, speed and precision. Um, but, but I think jewellery is in a unique position because we're, you know, we're there on the high street. Um, so we're actually able to kind of bring these, um, these mass customisation, mass personalisation technologies to the public. Um, you know, I mean, of, of course there are... There are examples of other crafts where that's the case, but there's very few crafts where every town has a high street jeweller with some kind of workshop capabilities. Uh, and certainly working in Derby, uh, which, is, which is where I'm, I'm from, um, we, uh, you know, we do have a, we have a CAD CAM milling machine and laser welder and TIG welder in addition to all the, uh, all the kind of traditional tools as well. So, um, so we're certainly in quite a lucky position. Um, so I think, yeah, we're creating this culture, uh, or we have this culture in the jewellery industry where people expect bespoke, uh, and I really hope that that will start to spread to, to other types of craft. Um, you know, it would be lovely to see uh, people working in all sorts of different materials on the high street. You know, I'd, I'd love to see ceramicists having a, a shop where someone can go in and, and commission some ceramic work to be, be made for them. Um, I certainly don't think you really see that at the moment. Of course, it's there at the high end, isn't it? Uh, but it's not a high street technology. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, once we get on to things like direct metal, metal sintering, which are, um, which are, at the moment, far, far beyond the price range of the kind of high street jeweller. Um, but as some other speakers have discussed, you know, these technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper all the time. So um, I, I can certainly imagine in 10 or 20 years, it's going to be, you know, kind of fairly normal to have that sort of technology on hand. Uh, and at that point, you'll be able to directly print jewellery uh, tools uh, to actually make the jewellery with. Um, and even potentially, you know, sort of make electronic devices and stuff like that, which is, which is really exciting. Um, so, as I, said, I mean, so I'll, I'll sort of finish with it, it's that, to restate that point, that uh, although the jewellery industry isn't the biggest driver of this kind of change, uh, I think we are the ones that are, that are really taking it onto the high street at, at the moment uh, and taking it to the consumer. Can I just pick up on your point about um, mass customisation and how it's already happening on the high street? How does that actually happen? Because other, other people might think that, you know, actually you can only achieve that with new technology. Well, I mean, that, that's quite an interesting one because on, on one level you've got um, the, the idea of mass customization that you have a, have a, a particular product uh, where you can swap out different components. Um, so, you know, I don't know, you might have a, 
have a, a pen with different hand grips that can go on it or, or different pushes on, on top. Um, and you'd maybe be able to go online and say, well, I'd like this pen, but I want it to have this little pusher bit on top and this little hand grip and this colour ink. Um, but with, with jewellery, I think, you know, there's a, there's a really strong bespoke element to it, which, I mean, possibly that's always been there with jewellery. Um, you know, people do, people do certainly come to our shop and expect a very bespoke service. You know, we rarely get anyone who just says, yeah, I'll have that one out the window or that one out of the domino catalogue. Um, you know, it, it, it really does tend to be people um, coming to us and saying, you know, can you make me this? I've always wanted one that looks like that. Um, so I feel like I'm drifting off the question there, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think there is, um, you know, possibly we always have had this mass customization uh, aspect to it, but I think increasingly um, it's becoming a, um, a bigger and bigger deal. Uh, and certainly it wouldn't surprise me before long if customers start coming in with their own CAD CAM, you know, their own CAD files. Um, and say not not medieval monks, you know, but but you know stuff on USB sticks, um, and um, yeah, and it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that very quickly uh, becomes the case because these uh, CAD technologies are again are getting cheaper and cheaper and more accessible, um, you know, and anyone with a bit of wit can uh, get a dodgy copy of them off the internet anyway. So, um, so I certainly think we're. Um, I'm not suggesting people should, but, most people <laughs> obviously, so, but, uh, but no, I certainly think that you know we. There is that, but it's different to the mass customisation that some industries are talking about, certainly. So, thank you very much for that. I need to move on to Karin now. Um, Karin, you're a regular visitor to um, high-end jewellery and silversmithing workshops, and um, over the last 10 years you've witnessed the uptake of technology in those environments. Um, do you have any examples of technology and the impact of of it on high-end uh, jewellery manufacturing or uh, silverware fabri fabrication? Yeah, de definitely. Um, there's a number of companies, um, I've brought some pictures along to, if you can show the first slide, um, where, um, as Jamie said, uh, laser welding is fairly standard now in manufacturing workshops. Um, and I've brought an example of someone, Kevin Gray, silversmith, who's using it um, uh, as a new new way of making silverware, so he's cutting strips of silver and, and lasering it to create a three-dimensional form. Um, and sorry, this is kind of funny. Um, Kevin actually trained at the Birmingham School of Jewellery um, after having um, 25 years in the automotive industry. So I think he's brought a lot of the uh, sort of uh, panel beating, beating side of uh, things to his um, silversmithing work. Um, another example, of course, is Tom Rooker. If you just show the slide, please. <laughs> um, Tom Rooker's entire um, collection is based around laser spot welding, and um, what he was finding, he spent six to eight hours a day on a on a um, laser machine, which has basically come from the dentistry industry. I think in around about 1995, and because of the volume of work and the amount of time he spends on it, he was fi having difficulty. Um, in a sort of muscular sense with getting his, his hands around the, the machine. So he's worked very closely with alpha lasers to come up with a um, solution to um, that sort of repetitive strain on, on his body. So what's happened with this one, he's, they've taken a, um, a very powerful laser and adapted, lowered the energy output, created more precision welding in order for him to be able to create these very fine forms. Um, Yeah, because well, when you think, if, if you could show me the next slide, um, a typical sphere like this one has got between 12 and 15,000 welds because every single join has multiple welds on it. Um, another example in the next slide is the recent work he did with this Nelson Mandela um, mask um, has got one sorry, 19.1 million welds on it, so you can imagine the strain on his body. But I think the point I'm making is these companies um, are quite willing to help to adapt the technology in order for the craftsperson to be able to um, uh, create what they, they want to create. Another example, a company I've worked with quite a lot over my years at the Goldsmiths Company is Grant McDonald Silversmiths, and they've worked collaboratively with Envision Tech Factory and their in-house casting expert in a sort of three-way dialogue of sharing data so that they can eventually grow these sort of large forms out of the resin and then um, directly cast them and sort of bypass the loss wax casting process. It doesn't work in every case, but they've, be they've built up a sort of knowledge bank of information, whereas they, they can pretty much predict that a form like that can be cast directly into silver, and of course it's scalable. Um, 
Um, I just think it's a very good example of working with a supplier and, and tweaking the machinery, and I'm sure that they pass that on to their customers as well. And the final slide I wanted to show, which is really, um, it's a silversmithing company down in Ashford, Richardson, and Ottawell, where speaking to them, a lot of the work they do is in the prototyping stage. They work, they work for a lot of um, luxury houses like LVMH and uh, design places like Meta. And they really find that they are used in the prototyping stage. Um, so they can create, they can rapidly respond, they've got the skills to flexibly create all these prototypes, and then they work very closely with aeronautical suppliers to, to mass produce these items for those companies. Um, another thing that's quite interesting about Richardson Ottawa, if, they, if they've gone out and deliberately you know, worked hard to get ISO certification so that they can work outside of the normal sort of silversmithing when you're into design and product design. Um. I find it very interesting that these individuals and, co and companies are using existing technology in order to bend it for their own needs. Do you think there's still a place for the traditional skill of the silversmith and jeweller? Well, yes, because they've got the silversmith and the jeweller is trained in materials and processes, so they have an inherent understanding of these two these two things. Um, they're, they're not defined by their tooling; they make their tooling often often in quite a lot of cases. Um, and they can respond very rapidly and flexibly to a brief, and they, they don't have to feed the data straight into a machine. They can sort of play with it in order to come up with a prototype. And, and I think sometimes the term silversmith or jeweler is quite, it's almost quite limiting because really, you know, a lot of, a lot of silversmiths and jewelers are engineers as well as craftspeople. Um, and as Jamie says, there's a possibility of um, jewel, the jeweler's innovative approach to problem solving as being the key to, to diversification. Um, and I've got an illustration of this. Pete Musson at um, the Royal College of Art is doing some really interesting work, very quietly behind the scenes. He's a silversmith, but he is very interested in engineering. So he has built his own four-axis milling machine purely from plans downloaded from the internet. I've got a little film here that... Oh, what have you done to it? <laughs> but he's built a four-axis milling machine purely from plans downloaded from the internet and open-source software to drive the, the CNC part of it. Um, and a machine like that for him to buy would be around about six or four thousand pounds, and it's come in at just over a thousand pounds. There's just a little video of it working. And he's also quite involved with these new um, fab labs, which I think there's quite a few of them worldwide now. They're basically small scale workshops offering personal digital manufacture, which I think is just very, very interesting. Um, Touching on the laser sintering that Jamie mentioned, that was mentioned earlier, what's interesting in our industry is that um, there's a laser sintering machine that Cooks and Metals is launching at Hong Kong, in Hong Kong this week, which is going to go on to develop in, um, sorry, EOS, the manufacturer is launching it in Hong Kong. It's going to go to Cooks and Precious Metals for development, and ultimately it's going to target the jewellery industry with manufacturing parts <coughs> directly into precious metal, which is a very, very new thing for our industry. Um, and obviously, this, although the target audience is jewellery, it could go into other, other areas like electronics, component manufacture. This is, this is just a video from their, their YouTube e-commerce site, showing them growing a metal part. Really, it's really cutting edge technology, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Tell me when you've had enough. Yeah, that's probably fine. <laughs> So I think, I think um, as Jamie alluded to, I think it was a very, very, very interesting time for, for precious metal and, and jewellery manufacture. I put up this slide which um, uh, was put up at the Global Design Forum on Tuesday at Central St. Martins, but this, this thingiverse where people are uploading STL files that you can just go in and access and, and, and pull down a model and build on it, expand it, you know, the idea that we might be um, sharing all these models in the future, it, show, it obviously throws up a very interesting challenge in terms of IP, which is a different conference altogether, I imagine. But I think, for me, what this is throwing up is that there's a real need for communication and collaboration and partnership, and this is a lot of the work that Benchpeg is trying to do, sort of link people up with each other, um, facilitating communication, and, and we're working on a number of, of projects to do this. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> um, We've had now from Jamie and from Corin 
how um, jewellers have historically and are currently manipulating technologies for their own needs and even affecting its progression. Um, I'd be interested to know if you've come across examples of how um, uh, cross-pollination of technologies in our industry might be happening in other sympathetic industries. Could you put up my thought bubble? <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I'm, the question that the conference, sort of one of the things the conference is addressing is looking at high technology or advanced technologies. Immediately threw up this question of how do you actually classify them? Is there a point that you've got an old technology and a new one? And uh, the, the, palladium, the development of palladium has been one of the issues that uh, sort of throws this into quite sharp relief because the lost wax casting method is 70, 80 years old in its current form, comes from the dentistry industry, comes into jewellery manufacture. But as far as palladium is concerned, you suddenly get a whole new set of requirements because the material absorbs oxygen so much when it's in the molten state. It has to be cast in a different in an inert environment. So what you end up is, do you call this an old technology or do you actually call it an advanced technology because you end up with this higher level? And actually, the jewellery industry is very interesting for that because where it pushes the technology level up, that then starts moving into other areas, but you're never quite sure what. Um, if you put the second one up. I mean, another integration area is, uh, this is in terms of the diamond industry that previously diamonds were cut and polished by hand. The whole thing was actually worked out in the diamond cutter's head. Now, there's a lot of computer-generated programs that you actually uh, create new cuts which uh, enhance the brilliance of the diamonds far more than you can ever do by thinking about it manually. And this is, uh, on the left, is the Wittelsbach Blue, which was an 18th century cut, which was recently recut by Graf so that is now the little graph, which has a far better internal refraction and reflection. Now, this immediately brings up the issue, should you start recutting all the historic diamonds in the world? And people have got different opinions about that. But this shows actually how much a standard technology gets enhanced by bringing in a computer element to it. But then the thing is still cut by hand. Um, Another one is the Swiss watch industry. I always like looking at the pictures of these just for the sake of them. Um, but interestingly, the, the little red dots, the 27 jewels that are sitting inside here, are all rubies that were artificially grown in a laboratory, and they're grown as monocrystals. And this technology is now used for growing some of the parts that go into jet engines. So the idea of doing this, and I think this is where our, our bio folk that we were talking about when you start thinking of what you can do with the technology, it moves into different areas because it's a way of thinking about it. The technology in terms of gem growing has, in heart, has uh, sort of moved into all sorts of different areas now, but the principle of growing one monocrystal, which is incredibly strong in relation to a, a normal multifaceted crystal, has been very important in high, in high technology, and yet it was being practiced 30, 40 years ago in terms of these watches um, and you know, if you've got a Swiss watch, it'll have false, false artificial diamonds or artificial rubies in it. Um, if you want to look on the next one. Um, we're all rather probably fed up of seeing these. Um, and of course, we always think of them in terms of being artworks that are created by artists. Both of these pieces were created by computers in terms of the fact that the original models were scanned and then those models were used to create the metalwork pieces that were fitted together. Um, the Kate Moss, each of the pieces was about 10 centimeters square, I believe it is, fitted together. The Damien Hirst skull, the platinum pieces, the models were uh, scanned off of the skull so that they fit exactly onto it. But then, of course, all the diamonds are set on there by hand. So all of these people, where the modern technology stops, where the traditional or established technology begins, is very difficult to identify. Do you start sort of sending one or not people to one side of the room and one or the other? When I go into factories or workshops, I tend to find that people are personally integrated, that people do not think of themselves as one thing or another. People actually in the workshops, in, in manufacturing environments, think of themselves as both. Or actually, they don't really think of it at all. They think of the product. 
And that this, that's a better, freer way of thinking, I think. Um, the second part, I just put some examples of cross-pollination in, because uh, I quite like looking what goes backwards and forwards. And this is a casting house, which uh, is, some of you may recognize it immediately who they are. Um, they're an established jewelry manufacturer. And they work with high-end watch UK watch manufacturers, specializing in platinum group metal castings. So this is a very established area. Um, but they also, if you can click on, um, they also do the platinum probes for jet engines. So they cast the jet engine probes in the same building as they do the watch, watch cases. So there's absolutely no division in terms of that. And the uh, company came to them because they are the premier platinum metal group casters. And like palladium, each one has got particular awkward, fussy qualities, apart from gold, which is wonderful, um, about casting. So you need to know that material. You need to have that material expertise. And actually, if you go to a standard caster, they tend to know base metals. They don't know precious metals in the same way. So. And the second one is actually about something called the XRF machine, the uh, X-ray fluorescence analysis, which I don't know if anybody is familiar with this, but uh, if you've had your work hallmarked in the last 10 years, you've come in contact with it whether you know about it or not. Because this is what's used in the assay offices a lot. And the machine has moved from elsewhere into precious metal analysis and then moved on from that to somewhere else. So we've imported the technology and then exported it again. When it started, it was to look at plating thicknesses. So it was used in industrial contexts. Um, the machines were enormous. What happened was the company that makes them, or one of the companies that makes them, identified that not only could they see where one metal changed to another, the plating thickness, they could actually identify the composition of the metal using the same equipment. So with some development, because the collectors had to be changed to suit precious metal, is they ended up creating a machine that you could identify, you can analyze simply by putting the piece on the machine, uh, closing it down and setting the reader, it will give you the composition of the, of the piece of jewelry. And so these, have, um, these were beta tested in the Birmingham assay office for about six years. So anybody who's got a Birmingham assay mark, you've been using this. Um, but if you want to click on. This has provided the impetus for the next level of these machines, which are now handheld. And these have gone all over the place. Not only do you have them um, for checking your scrap precious metal that you go into the, you flog off on the, to the um, postal gold site, but you also get them in mines, which is actually where 20, 30 years ago they were originally looking at using them. Uh, you get them in quality control situations to identify the wells. And you also get them in scrap yards, in the metal repossessing, uh, re, can't say it, repossessing, re, pr reprocessing, I can't even say it. <laughs> Let's leave that. Um, so what's happened is the technology's come in because of the jewelry industry, because there was this body of interest, the machines got developed. Now they're getting developed even more, and now they're spreading to a large number of environments. So you'll probably, if you go to Hatton Garden, and take anything to the trade counter. The guy's got one of these behind the desk now. And that's actually come through the assay office situation. Um, and I, I took my option to phone a friend uh, as I was asked the question, um, because I've worked with various people in different gold working sections. Um, I phoned up a gold technologist who works with satellite development. And I thought, you know, let's, let's be as topical and as advanced technology as you can. And I said, said to him, well, you know, what's the biggest craft influence on satellite production that you can think of off the top of your head, expecting it to be something to do with gold production, of course. Um, and he said, well, the, the Metop B, which was launched two days ago, um, that solar panel is actually derived from Japanese paper folding technology. And the reason it's so unusual is if you pull one corner, the whole thing opens out which doesn't normally happen with paper when you fold it up. This means you only need one server, and therefore you've lightened the payload of the satellite. 
And this was one of the biggest problems that they've been having with the satellites, with these huge solar panels. How do you open something out with minimal effort? And they went to a technology which is distinctly established in order to find the answer. So the idea of what something can be used for in the future is never really established. We're all in, a, in what Levi-Strauss called a sort of bricolage situation. If you have this whole set of skills, you never know where they're going to be put in the future. So it's quite difficult to predict. It's actually having the freedom to think about what you're doing rather than just getting trammeled that's the important thing. And it's the people who've been really open with their technologies are the ones who seem to be pushing things the furthest. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Peter.